want to record to the cloud. There we go. All right. So I want to welcome you to Peter White Public Library, everybody. Um, my name is um, Marty Ackett, and I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator for the library. And it is my extreme pleasure to introduce tonight's presenter for our monthly Women in Science series, uh, Dr. Tori Tagle. Corey, oh boy, Corey Tagle. <laughs> Um, if there's one thing um, these past two years have taught most of the world, it is the importance of science and the need to recognize the contributions of scientists in solving the world's most difficult and dramatic issues from health to hunger to climate. Um, when I started Women in Science two, a year ago, my goal was to provide a platform for women in STEM fields to speak about their backgrounds and their work. Um, women in Science has allowed me to interact and learn from some of the most brilliant people I've ever had the privilege of meeting. Um, having come from an extended family of strong and very intelligent women, I know that when someone smarter than you starts talking, what you need to do is sit down, be quiet, and simply listen. Corey is no exception to that rule. Um, uh, Corey had received her master's and PhD degrees in psychology with an emphasis on behavioral analysis from Western Virginia University. Um, she has interests in the experimental analysis of behavior and applied behavior analysis. Um, she has completed many studies using animal models of complex human behavior with the focus of improving clinical issues and practice. She's also a board certified behavioral analysis an analyst and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Learn Behavioral, where she focused on providing behavioral services to children with autism and training caregivers to implement behavioral techniques. She is currently an assistant professor and teaches classes in the psycholo psychological science program at Northern Michigan University. Um, but now it is time for me to do what I do best on Women in Science Nights. I'm going to sit down and be quiet, and I'm going to listen, and I'm going to learn a great deal. Please join me in welcoming to Peter White Public Library, uh, Dr. Corey Tagle. It's all yours, Corey. All right, it's so exciting to be here. I'm gonna pull up my presentation now. All right, can you see that okay? Perfect. So I'm going to talk about my background in behavior analysis and in science and how I got here, got to be here today. And uh, I'll talk about some of my current research as well in the Department of Psychological Science. And so thank you for being here today. And if you're watching this later, thanks for showing up later. So I'll go ahead and get started. First, I wanted to talk about where I am from. So originally, I was born in Florida in 1991, but I didn't live there very long. As a baby, my parents moved us up to West Virginia, where my mother is from, and I lived there for most of my life. So I really was raised in West Virginia, and I also got uh, most of my education in West Virginia. And I didn't leave West Virginia until 2020, uh, just about when the pandemic started, which point I moved to Maryland to complete a postdoctoral fellowship. And I lived there for about a year and a half and till recently this past summer when I moved to Michigan, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan here in Marquette which I absolutely love being here. And I hope uh, maybe this will be my last stop on the map, who knows? And so that's a little bit about my background. I wanted to also show my family, my support system. Here in the middle, this is my husband, Forrest Tegel. And this is also our baby who was born this past August. And this, her name is Hallie. She's six months old. I had Hallie just about six weeks after moving here to Marquette. So she is a true youper, which is pretty exciting. 
And uh, so this is my little family. My husband, Forrest, here also works in the psychological science department, and we do some of the research together that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I also have two pets. So here on the left is my dog, Teddy. It's a hound dog, and we love her so very much. And then on the right is our cat, Piper. Uh, she's not very nice, but we still love her. And so this is uh, my family here in Marquette, and I'm so excited to uh, have them here with me. So I want to talk a little bit about my education. I'm going to break down how I got into science across all of these different levels, but I did all of my degrees, my Bachelor of Science, my Master's of Science, and my doctoral degree at West Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia, which is about two hours from where I grew up. So I was pretty close to my family throughout that period. Um, but I'll start with my bachelor's of science degree. So I showed up to West Virginia University and I was not originally a psychology major. In fact, I was a biology major and uh, I started doing that. I was pre-med and it turned out that I, I wasn't very passionate about biology. I wasn't very passionate about pre-med and it just ended up not really working for me. I decided that biology was not my calling, but fortunately I had taken a couple of psych classes. I was a psychology minor. And so I switched over to that and I decided that I was going to try out some, some psychology. So I took a couple more classes, but I didn't really know what aspect of psychology I wanted to do. I was just kind of exploring different classes, but I still felt a little bit lost uh, until you know, I started doing a little bit of research and I joined a social psychology laboratory where I completed a graduation requirement project where I studied interracial roommate relationships. And I uh, presented at the university poster session on some of these findings. I don't remember a lot about this project, but I do remember that pretty much everybody hates their college roommate, regardless of race, is the a spoiler alert on that research. And so I did that project and kind of got my feet wet in science, but I just still wasn't very passionate about this type of psychology. It just wasn't really my calling, the spark wasn't there. And so I kept pursuing other types of courses in psychology. And eventually I came across uh, Psychology 302 called Behavior Principles, which was a course that all psychology majors at West Virginia University have to take. And it's a pretty rigorous course. There's the lecture component, and then there's a laboratory portion of the course, which meets multiple times a week. And so what you see here is a rat in an operant chamber. And our job in this laboratory was to train this rat to press the lever and watch the learning process happen live before our eyes. And after we taught it to press the lever, then we did a couple of other experiments to uh, see the learning process happen. And I really loved this. This I thought that this was pretty cool. It was fun to watch it all happen uh, right there before my eyes and as a result of what I did. And as I started to learn more in this class, I realized that you know this aspect of psychology was quantitative. It was very scientific. It, it made sense to me. And so it was something that my, my interest was finally peaked in some facet of psychology. I finally thought I might find what I could do. And it also turned out that I was pretty good at this class. And so this class is really interesting in that the top students for each exam that got a high A's on, on the exam would be awarded a pen to, to write with. And it reads, for a distinguished performance in Psych 302 Behavior Principles. And I thought that this was just the coolest thing in the world. And I ended up with four of these pens for my exam uh, performance. I wish that I could say that there were only four exams, but unfortunately there were five. <laughs> and so I didn't get the fifth pen, which I'll always regret, uh, but I did get an A on that test, just not the best A. And so, this was something that I thought was really cool. And that it turned out I was 
pretty good at. And so I started to look into this a little bit more. And I learned that the principles used in this course are related to an entire field of work called behavior analysis. And so I did a little bit more digging and learned that behavior analysis is just a branch of psychology. So psychology is this really broad field that includes things like neuroscience and developmental psychology, clinical psychology, even forensic psychology. It's just one of those branches among more. I, I couldn't put them all on this graphic because there's just so many different types of psychology. So behavior analysis is one of those. And what it is just from its core is the scientific study of human behavior. And so we want to know why people do what they do. So why are they behaving the way they are behaving? Why do people behave in a positive manner and why do they behave in sometimes a negative manner? So this is what I wanted to go into. And so I wanted to learn, well, what can I do with a degree in psychology and behavior analysis? And so I learned that there are typically three facets of behavior analysis. We have our uh, basic research here, which is just like the class that I took where we study behavior principles and processes in a laboratory setting, typically with animal models. Uh, however, another facet of it is the clinical research side where we study the effectiveness of different types of behavioral interventions, oftentimes with individuals with developmental disabilities, for example. We study those in the lab or in natural environments. And it's this research that gives us our evidence-based practices. So it's the stuff that scientifically shows that this is what you should be doing in clinical practice. It provides that scholarly evidence for that. And the last thing that you can do as a career in behavior analysis is be a practitioner or a therapist that implements behavioral interventions in natural environments. So these are the people that you would call if your child has a developmental disability or someone you might call if you have a substance use disorder. For example, we have therapists that work through those things with you. And so I learned a little bit more about it as this undergraduate student and I had to pick, right? So if, you know, which route are you gonna go with this? And ultimately I decided that must be a trick question because I would like to do them all. <laughs> and so I developed a very long to-do list. I, I wanted to do all of these things. And so what ended up happening was that because I did so well in that behavior principles course, I got invited to join a research lab at West Virginia University as a research assistant. And so this is Dr. Michael Perrone, who was my mentor while I was there. He runs an experimental analysis of behavior lab that works with rats and pigeons to study basic behavioral processes in these animal models. And so I joined this lab mostly because I just thought it sounded like a cool thing to do and I, uh, I didn't have anything else to do. So I, I joined this lab and started to learn about some basic research. Here are a couple of pictures of uh, things from our lab. Here's me holding one of our pigeon subjects, which are larger than you might think they would be. And so he's uh, eating out of a little cup here while I'm holding him. And then here is one of our pigeons in the operant chambers that we use for our bird subjects. They respond by pecking on one of these key lights here. And so we measure their behavior by what they do in here. And then we normally also work with these white sprag dolly rats, which are very cute and very nice. And so I joined this lab and I did kind of the grunt work of the lab. You know, I helped run the daily sessions. I helped record the data. I learned what it meant to do laboratory research. And I guess that I spoke up enough and showed enough interest because they ended up letting me do my own independent project in this lab. And this is where I got my grounding in science within behavior analysis. And so I started a project where I studied uh, a clinical intervention using rat subjects. Uh, you might 
know what it is. It's called timeout from positive reinforcement, which is you know, simply the procedure that some parents or teachers use when a child is misbehaving. You put them in timeout, right? You want to get them to stop doing whatever the behavior is that they were doing, so you put them in timeout. Uh, however, that procedure, though it's really commonly used, doesn't have a lot of evidence behind it. We don't know how it works as a psychological process. We don't know why it works. And so I brought this into the lab and I studied this procedure as an undergraduate. And here's me presenting the research at my first professional conference in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And so I got to travel to my first conference here. And so that is what kind of set off my interest in behavior analysis and helped me decide which route I was going to go in. So I continued doing this research as an undergraduate and I continued doing more projects and presenting at more conferences. And here is my, my main team from my laboratory at that time. I have my mentor, Dr. Michael Perone. And then I also have another student that was in the lab, Forrest Tegel, who is now my husband. <laughs> so we met in the research laboratory doing this work together. It was a, we often presented our research side by side. So here was my poster I was presenting at the conference and his was back here. <laughs> so we frequently got to do the science together, which was really fun. And so that was my undergraduate experience. And because I did so much of that, I wanted to continue it into my graduate school training. And so I stayed at West Virginia University and continued doing that type of work. And I did my master's thesis on that same topic of timeout using rat models of behavior, studying this as a behavioral process. So then I moved on to my PhD in psychology, emphasis in behavior analysis, where I used pigeons this time in an animal model. And I was interested in studying an animal model of behavior that we commonly see with individuals with autism and developmental disabilities and that they struggle transitioning between different activities in their life and it can cause disruptions. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. So I'm gonna come back to that type of work. So what this gave me in my education was my gold star in basic research. I mastered that part of what I was trying to get at here. And so that was some of my basic research background, uh, but I wanted to do more, right? I decided I wanted to do all of these facets of behavior analysis. And so I also got my clinical certification. And so I became a board certified behavior analyst at the doctoral level, which for behavior analysis is really the equivalent of being a clinical psychologist. And so that's just the type of certification we get instead of that other license. So this gives us the ability to work with humans out in the field. So work with individuals with developmental disabilities or, or other uh, people on behavioral interventions. And so while I was getting this certification, I worked with uh, children often in school settings that had challenging behavior. And so some children had developmental disabilities or other disorders like traumatic brain injury or um, ADHD. And for you know, whatever reason, they had a lot of behavioral issues in school. And so they called me in to figure out why this was happening and to train the teachers on how to manage this behavior. And so I got a lot of experience in special education and regular education classrooms to help manage challenging behavior. And uh, I, I also did a brief spot consulting in a nursing home, a state funded nursing home, working with geriatric patients and helping with some of their challenging behavior as well that were associated with things like uh, dementia and the aging process. And so I would come in and help with some of those clinical presentations. And so during my graduate school, I also was able to learn how to do clinical practice. So I was able to do that. So I only had one thing left and that was to fill uh, the niche of clinical research. 
And I, I did uh, some clinical research projects at West Virginia University that I, I don't have enough time to talk about here, but I also followed up my training with a postdoctoral fellowship. And so this is where I went to work for a private company that serves children up through adulthood that have autism spectrum disorder. It's insurance funded services where we go in and uh, provide whatever they need. Most of the time it is teaching small children with autism how to talk. Sometimes for the first time, they might not have ever said any words in their life. We teach them how to talk. We teach them life skills and educational skills that they are gonna need to be able to succeed in their life. And so part of my role in my postdoctoral fellowship was to manage a clinical caseload and oversee these therapies happening for these clients. And the other part of my fellowship was to conduct research for the company. And so the company was really interested in developing a caregiver training program and uh, being able to train the parents of the children that we worked with how to do these interventions. And so I helped them develop that model and helped them develop a research plan for how to evaluate that that training is really working. And I'm going to also get to that research in a moment because I'm, going, I'm continuing it while here at Northern Michigan. So I'll come back to that. But I set out and I achieved what I had hoped for. I did the basic research, the clinical research and the clinical practice side of behavior analysis. And so, I was really excited about that. I love that I had all of those experiences and I wanted to continue doing all of this. And so I had to figure out what job will allow me to do all of these somewhat different types of work. And the answer to that question is Northern Michigan University. And so I am now an assistant professor of psychological science here at Northern Michigan University. I work with all of these wonderful people here on the screen in the department. And so these are all, this is our department head and all of the other uh, faculty members that teach our students here and conduct research in our department. And so my roles as an assistant professor consist of teaching courses. And so I teach psychology courses to undergraduate students and graduate students in our master's program. And I also teach applied behavior analysis courses. And so that certification that I told you about that allows me to be able to work clinically uh, with human populations, I teach the courses that allow other people to gain that certification and be able to practice clinically. So there's a whole course sequence that people have to take to be able to get that certification. And I teach some of those classes so that they can do that. The other role that I have is in research. And so we have recently started up a rat laboratory for those animal models that I, I talked about from my, um, from my previous education. And we're working on getting our clinical laboratory up and going soon so that we can start some of our parent training research. Um, my other role is service. So I of course serve on committees for students doing research and university committees. I advise students and help to recruit as well. And so I wanna, what I wanted to focus on for the rest of this talk is on the research that I have going on here at Northern Michigan University and the stuff that we're getting up and going. So we have started the Tagle Laboratory, nice names for me and my husband, Forrest Tagle. And uh, we do a lot of different research and we're setting up a lot of different things in our laboratory. There's our website if you wanna learn a little bit more about it. But we have animal models of behavior. We're working on getting clinical application going and other clinical research. And so what I wanna tell you about today are two of the lines of research that we're going to get up first, uh, gonna get started first. And the first is in our rat laboratory. So our animal models to study clinical problems. And so if you're not familiar with using animals in psychology, I first wanted to talk about why we would do that in the first place, why we would use a rat model instead of just a human to study psychological issues. 
And some of the research topics that we're interested in involve challenging behavior for individuals with developmental disabilities. So trying to figure out from a process-based perspective, why does that happen in the first place? So can we bring that problem into the lab and figure out what's going on there and why, that, why they're engaging in challenging behavior? Or uh, can we study common behavioral procedures? So that's like some of the research that I did on timeout. You know, people are out there doing different behavioral procedures, but we don't know how it works. We don't know why it works. There's no science behind it. And so I bring it into the lab and I study the variables that are important and how, and I'm able to then inform practice with that. We also study a lot of other research topics, including things like self-control and impulsivity, which are types of behavioral patterns that govern things like substance use and addiction. And so we can study those with our animal models as well, and then inform clinical practice on why those things are happening. And so back at it, why use animal models? Well, it's important to be able to control important environmental variables, so bringing it into the lab, we can look at it from just the bare bones of the process of what things are operating, what are the principles that govern that behavior. And we don't have to worry about um, a lot of other limitations that come, come with bringing humans into the lab that make it really hard to understand what's really going on because we can put it in this analog model and figure out what's really important without a bunch of extraneous issues going on. Also, Animal models are convenient. It's very expensive um, and inconvenient to do human research. Human subjects often don't show up to their research sessions or they bring a lot of other things to the table that make the research really hard to do. Like maybe they didn't get a lot of sleep that night. Maybe they had a fight with their significant other or they show up to the lab and they're just really hungry and in a bad mood. And it can throw off the research results and make it hard to understand what's really going on in the studies. And that doesn't happen with our animal models. We can look at the pure behavioral process with our animal models because they don't have all of these other things going on in their lives. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of our methods, and then I'm going to give you an example of one of our research projects. And so we often use uh, Sprague Dolly rats, which are um, albino rats, and they're, they're fairly large and they're fairly kind rats. They're very easy to handle. And they typically work in what are called operant chambers. So that's this entire box right here. And what we do is we study the choices that the rat makes and the behavior that the rat engages in. And so we have multiple levers in here, What you see this rat doing is he's actually pressing down on a lever right now. So that's the behavior we're interested in is pressing levers. We have multiple levers in here. Uh, you know, there's another one. He could press that lever and make different choices. And we are interested in what choices he'll make and what environmental factors are going to make that rat make those choices. And so we have a lot of other things going on in this chamber. We have lights over here and we have lights over here. Uh, food pellets are delivered to the rat to motivate the rat to engage in different behavior. And we can, uh, we have speakers in there to play a bunch of tones so that we can mimic the things that are going on in the environment that control the behavior. And so this is how we're able to set up these situations that are akin to the human behavior setup. And so to give you an example, I want to talk about one of the projects that my master's student is working on. This is Carson Yermark in the psychological department, and he's working on the topic of activity transitions. And so that's not a complex topic. Activity transitions just mean going from one thing to the next thing. So stopping the current activity that you're doing and moving on to the next activity. So before you logged in to this webinar, you were doing something. And so you must have stopped whatever you were doing. You opened up your computer and you transitioned to this new activity. And so we have tons of these transitions all day long, all throughout our lives. We transition to and from different things going on. So here, for example, we going from having lunch into the meeting, right? And so that's not normally a problem. We, we uh, don't normally see that big of a disruption for people. 
But sometimes there are other situations where we do see disruptions. And so for example, you might go on this really luxurious vacation that you've been excited about all year. You have so much fun while you're there, but what happens when it's over? You have to go back. You have to go back to work. You have all the laundry, you have all the work you got going. And oftentimes we see disruptions in people's behavior. You know, maybe they're a little bit depressed going back. Maybe they're a little bit anxious about it. Maybe they're just not in a good mood or they just don't feel like getting right back to work. They might have to take a couple more days to be able to get right back into their work. And so that can be a little bit disruptive to your behavior. But again, that's not really a big problem. Typically people roll right through that. They get right back into their routine. But for individuals with developmental disabilities, such as autism spectrum disorder, these transitions are really particularly problematic. And so oftentimes when we have these children having to transition between things, maybe stop playing with that and come over and eat dinner or transitioning from recess to math class, we see really giant disruptions in their behavior. And oftentimes what happens and so we get some of these negative things happening. When they're asked to do these things, they show a big tantrum, they engage in aggression towards other people or are not compliant with instructions from teachers, maybe engage in self-injury or have really a big emotional outburst. And so it, in some cases, it can be very difficult during these transition pe uh, periods. And this has been a huge problem within developmental disabilities. And there are lots of books of people trying to solve this problem of why this happens and what you can do about it. Because all of these things are disruptive to the learning environment. They stop that child from being able to continue learning. They disrupt things for the teachers, for the families and learners. If you have to stop and deal with a tantrum that lasts an hour or two, that means that nobody's learning in that situation and it's very disruptive. And so what we're interested in from a laboratory perspective are these experimental questions. So why do these disruptions in behavior occur in the first place? And what types of behavioral treatments are going to be effective? So we wanna bring this clinical issue into the laboratory and figure out why it's happening so that we can fix it and help tell clinicians and teachers and parents what they can do to help uh, stop this from happening. And so here's where we bring in our animal model, right? So with our rats here, what we would do is have our rats transition between doing different things. And so in, the, in this case, we might have the rat pressing a lever so he's working for food, and, but uh, after he presses it so many times, he gets a large amount of food. And that's a good activity, something he wants to do because he gets a large payout from it. But then sometimes we signal to the rat that you're going to keep working, you're gonna keep pressing the lever, but we're only gonna give you a small amount of food. And while that's good and that's positive reinforcements, that's a less favored activity. Nobody wants to work for a little bit less when sometimes they get a little bit more. And so we can arrange these transitions for the rat to happen every so often, just like what happens in the clinical situation. He has to transition between doing one thing and then maybe he has to press the other lever and it's not gonna be as fun. And so what we see in these animal models is exactly what we see in the clinical situation. We see these disruptions in behavior occur. It matters to the rats. They turn around, they start doing something else. If we have another rat in there, they might aggress toward that rat. And so we see some of those same clinical issues in these situations with our animal models, which is great. That means that we have an animal model that is akin to what we see in the clinical situation. And so what we do at that point is try to find the important variables. So what can we do in this laboratory model to make it so that the rat doesn't engage that behavior, it get, gets right back to work without disruption? Or can we try a different treatment to see if we can reduce that disruption in behavior in our rat model, and then we'll try it with humans if it works. And so we've published some of our work on that, and we are continuing this line of research to be able to inform clinicians about what can you do about this type of behavior when you see it.
happening. So I'm happy to uh, talk more about those publications or send them to anybody that might be interested in it. But that's some of the type of work we're going to continue in our rat laboratories breaking down these clinical issues with our rat models and figuring out why they're happening in the first place. And so another line of research that we have going is uh, clinical research that's designed to enhance caregiver training procedures. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background now on autism spectrum disorder, because that's uh, what we're gonna be talking about most of the time when we're training caregivers. And so for those of you that don't already know, autism spectrum disorder and other developmental disabilities are often presented in children as uh, any of these deficits that I've listed here. So they might have mild or very profound delays in language, ranging from not being able to talk at all or only having a very limited set of speech, or maybe they just don't have very many functional skills that will help them in life and in education. We often also see deficits in social skills and some perseverative and repetitive behavior. And in some cases, like I mentioned, we see pretty significant behavioral challenges like aggression and tantruming. So these are a lot of the symptoms that we see with this disorder that can be really problematic. And uh, you know, on, on that note, it's, this isn't rare. This is very prevalent. Autism spectrum disorder is uh, estimated to be an, occur in about one in 59 children as of 2018, and that number has been rising across years. And so it's a very prevalent disorder. And in 2020, here in the UP, there were 446 school aged children that were receiving special education services for that autism diagnosis. And, and that's just the children that have been diagnosed and that have services available to them. That number should actually probably be higher than that for people that haven't had access to services yet. So it's a really prevalent issue. Uh, but fortunately, we have applied behavior analysis. So this is the clinical aspect of what I do. And applied behavior analysis therapies have been the most widely used and evidence-based therapies. They are the most effective and they are what doctors prescribe as soon as you get that diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And so the treatment typically involves uh, helping people learn how to speak, how to do functional skills and uh, how to learn social skills, things like that. And it typically occurs in school if they're, they're school-aged child or it can occur in a clinic. Sometimes uh, individuals get the diagnosis as early as 18 months of age and they're not in school yet. So we work with them in a clinic setting. We have one here at Northern Michigan. It's called the Bear Center where you can bring your child with autism and we can provide that therapy. Or sometimes we provide in-home treatment. So we bring someone to your house to work with your child. And so that's where we often have treatment and the treatment is generally delivered by trained therapists. So people with that certification I've talked about that know how to provide that clinical practice, or if they're in school, it would be their teachers that are providing that, normally the special education teachers that are providing that treatment. And this is great. This therapy works really well. Um, but as with any therapy, it needs to be extended to the child's entire life. You know, we don't want children to only learn skills in school or in the clinic and only use them there. We want them to bring them home with them and be able to talk to their parents and talk to their family and have all of those skills with everybody in their life. And to be able to achieve that, we have to get our caregivers, our parents involved in the treatment. So what we need to do is train them how to implement this treatment when there is not a therapist there to do it. And what we have found in the research is that when caregivers are involved in treatment, we get, a, we, we get to maximize the intervention benefit. We get better outcomes for our clients when their, their parents are also delivering the treatment all throughout their day. It helps the parents to be able to manage behavior problems better it helps the parents to be able to enhance uh, the communication and adaptive skills that their kids have learned so that they, 
they do it in all of their life. And so we really enhance treatment by getting by taking a whole approach and getting everybody involved, including the caregivers. One other positive effect of having caregivers involved is that it can impact their mental health and well being. And so one really common issue that happens for families that have a child with autism spectrum disorder is that there's a lot of stress in the family and parents often don't feel confident in being able to deal with the symptoms of this disorder. And a lot of times families end in a very sad outcomes such as divorce, they break up because of how stressful that it is to have a child in this situation. And so by involving them in treatment, we have shown in the literature that we can reduce stress in these families, increase confidence of dealing with some of these symptoms of autism and keep those families together. And so that's great. We know we get them involved, that's great, but not everybody has the time to, or the ability to come into a clinic and learn all of these um, things that they should be doing for treatment or have someone come in and train them. And so the research that I'm interested in is developing caregiver training that is virtual. And so what this solves is problems of lack of treatment access. And so one issue with the rising cases of autism is that we just don't have enough therapists out there to be able to provide therapy to every single person. And so we often have long wait lists. Here in Marquette at the uh, Bear Center, we have a long wait list. We have people that want our therapy, but we don't have enough people to give it to them. And so if we can train caregivers to provide the treatment themselves, then they don't have to wait for a spot to be able to get that treatment for their child. They can do it for themselves. Um, another problem with treatment access is geographic location. We know that the UP is very rural. There are a lot of rural areas, not here in Marquette, but the farther and farther out you get, there's less out there. And we don't have clinics in many spots in the UP. In fact, Marquette is one of the only areas that have these types of treatments. So individuals with autism that live way out in the UP might not get any treatment at all. And so if we can provide virtual training for these caregivers using a telehealth model, they can get what they need to be able to treat, the, treat their child and treat these symptoms. And the last note on treatment access is that treatment is very expensive. When we're talking about bringing a child into the clinic every day, the insurance pays for that and it can get very pricey. And so if we're talking about families that don't have insurance, they typically can't afford it. It can be tens of thousands of dollars for this therapy. And so what we can offer them is a virtual caregiver training program that can be a little bit more affordable because it doesn't require that a person is right there with you every single day. On that note, it can also be helpful for people that do have current services. And so parents are busy. They can't always take the time to come into the clinic and, uh, you know, they have other things going on. They have other children that they're worried about. And so by making things virtual, we can make it convenient for them. They can learn uh, these training procedures whenever it works for them on weekends or late in the evening. And it doesn't, it can be whenever they want it to be. And they can be self-paced as well. And so the whole idea of creating training that is virtual is to reach people that wouldn't otherwise have the ability to learn how to work with their children and, and run these procedures to help with their symptoms. And so what this looks like often, it, it could be a variety of things. Typically it's a telehealth consultation or it's some type of live virtual coaching. So they can walk individuals through working with their child to uh, do some of these therapies and, and they can train them on what to do and what not to do via video technology. It can also look like an e-learning course. So there can be e-learning modules. There can be video models showing people exactly what to do. There could be interactive animations uh, that they can do at their own pace. Finally, we also have manuals that people can read or any combinations of these things can be involved in these caregiver training programs. And so this is great. We want to provide this service to families that need it. But what we need to know from a research perspective 
is which of these things are going to be effective? So here are some of our experimental questions that we're interested in evaluating. We wanna know which of those types of trainings that I talked about are actually going to be effective. And I don't wanna create a manual system and give it to a family and it's, it doesn't actually work and it doesn't help them. And so one thing that we're doing is working to develop these training modules, test them and disseminate them when we know that they're effective. So what types of training are going to be effective? What are gonna to lead to the best child outcomes? and which of them are going to reduce stress and increase confidence in caregivers. And so we want to find the most evidence-based type of training to get these parents the things that they need to be able to um, give this therapy to their child. And so that is what I have. And uh, I guess, do you have any questions for me? I also have my contact information on here in our laboratory website. And I'm always happy to chat. Okay. Yeah, um, if, if anybody wants to, um, you can put questions in chat if you want, or you can unmute and ask any question that you might have. Um, I, I, one question that I had, which is, I don't, I don't know, um, my son had, as was diagnosed with ADHD, and a lot of those um, behaviors that you talked about where that children with autism have with uh, transitions, were very similar to this the the problems he had transitioning between classes and stuff sometimes mm -hmm. is that is that i mean i is there a similarity between like children with adhd and autism and in, in that absolutely and actually we all have those issues you know i i mm -hmm. have those issues when i have to transition from something i really like working on and then i have to go to a meeting i might walk mm -hmm. a little bit slower show up mm -hmm. late to the meeting you know do something like that and so as a process it is ubiquitous for everybody the problem is that it's just exacerbated with people that have um, developmental disabilities or any other disorder such as ADHD. I also worked with clients that had ADHD that struggled with some of those transitioning issues. Um, and sometimes those th issues work out themselves, but sometimes they don't and the problem can keep getting worse without therapy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it uh, happens to all of us <laughs> for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you said that, um, that the prevalence of, um, ASD is is increasing. Is that because it's being diagnosed more, or is that, or or is it that you know children weren't being diagnosed and now they are, and that's why we see the increase in numbers, or is it literally you know increasing I, uh, for I, some other reason? I wish I could answer that question, but like you said, it, it's complicated, and we don't know. We don't know if we were just missing people before, or it could be that the criteria for being diagnosed have been more relaxed. So we're capturing mm -hmm. more people in that. But we do, we do know that autism has some genetic components and it also has environmental components. Developmental disabilities mm -hmm. have environmental components that are related to things like pollution mm -hmm. and, you know, other things that can happen to people in their environment. And so it, it's kind of tough to say what's causing the increase there. Okay, all right. Um, let's see, I, I wrote down all kinds of questions. So uh, if anybody else had any questions, please jump in. Um, uh, so my one of my questions is um, uh, the, the, the study that you did about um, uh, um, timeouts, uh, mm -hmm. that, that um, I remember with my daughter, I never was successful with timeouts whatsoever. And I'm wondering what your, what your research found about whether timeouts were actually something that were useful or effective or if they're not useful or effective. Because in my, in my situation, I didn't find them very useful. Uh, they didn't help that much. Yeah, so timeout is a really... Believe it or not, it's a complicated process, and there mm -hmm. are a lot of different ways to implement a timeout. And I'm sure you noticed there were a lot of choices that you had to make. You had to decide, you know, what warranted going in a timeout mm -hmm. in the first place. How many times could they get away with it before they went in a timeout? How long is the timeout mm -hmm. last? 
you know, there's a lot of recommendations out there that are, they say something like, put them in timeout for one minute for every year of age that yeah. they are. And, you know, that maybe is a useful guideline to start with, but it's not based on evidence. You know, it's not based mm -hmm. on anything scientific. And so there are all of these choices that people have to make that aren't based on science. And so that's the model of, with animals that I, we studied. And so we wanted to know at, under what conditions is a timeout going to be effective? And mm -hmm. essentially what we learned is that it's only gonna be effective if you're taking them away from something that they are currently enjoying doing and you put them somewhere where it's not fun. And so mm -hmm. if uh, you take them from the one situation and put them in another that's just as fun, maybe their bedroom with toys or some other mm -hmm. area, then it's definitely not gonna work, you know? Okay. Or if it doesn't last long enough, then it's probably not gonna work. And so there's a lot of kind of caveats that we teased out in our research of what you really have to pay attention to, to make sure that they're effective. But, but yeah, like, you know, you, you probably didn't have good guidelines when you wanted to use that. And that's because there's no science on it. Right, and that's what it was for me. Like how long, the, the big question was how long do you leave them on time out? And then, and then it always seemed like my, my daughter, especially, if I took her away from something that she was enjoying, put her in time out in a different place, she always found something else to enjoy in that other place. <laughs> and so it yeah. was just not, it was not an effective strategy whatsoever mm -hmm. for, for us anyway. I mean, or probably I wasn't doing it correctly. I don't know, but. Um, no, but you know, your, your daughter outsmarted the procedure, you know, she was <laughs> able to have fun. And so it, you weren't, able to remove her from a fun situation and for you know children like that it's probably not going to be effective right right yeah uh, uh let's see does anybody oh um oh my my this is my wife she, she <laughs> said she started to enjoy looking at the wall that's what she said that's true <laughs> it's like we'd put her just you have to face the wall and somehow she enjoyed that as well so um <laughs> yeah you know when one common example I give is um teachers make the mistake a lot of the time of giving a kid a time out by kicking them out of the classroom mm. and first of all most of the time the kid probably doesn't want to be in the classroom mm -hmm. and so if you're kicking them out that's not removing them from something good it's it's probably right. going to be a, a reward for them but even if you you are removing them they do want to be there if you just put them out in the hallway well, there's probably going to be people that walk by and talk mm -hmm. to them and they can play with stuff out there. And so, yeah, un knowing the conditions of when timeout will be effective is, is super important. And that's some of the stuff that we learned in our animal models. Mm, yeah. Um, let's see. If any other, if I missed anything, okay. Um, let's see. I have a couple more. Um <laughs> Um, so, oh, one of my questions, how, how um, close are you to having your laboratory up and running at Northern, the one that you're, you're establishing? Yes, yeah, so our uh, rat laboratory, which is in, uh, in an office here in Weston Hall on campus, that is up and going, and we're, mm. we've ordered the rats for our master's students project, and so that's all ready to go. In terms of the caregiver training, um, that's still in the works. We're still working on developing what the training is going to look like. And so in what mm -hmm. form we're gonna do the training and we're probably going to recruit families from the bear center. And so that's probably going to get going within the next year is our timeline mm -hmm. for starting that research. Mm -hmm. And, and I would assume that, you know, creating those, uh, that virtual caregiver training, which is a fantastic idea, especially for an area like this where, you know, it's next to impossible to get all children that need the help. Mm -hmm. And like you said, there's so many and there's so few people who can do it. Um, so um, how long do you think before you have like a caregiver, um, a virtual caregiver training that's going to be effective and useful. I mean, how in the process are you in that? Well, to have kind of a full on, this is everything you need to know mm -hmm. with your child with autism, that's probably more of a five-year plan mm -hmm. because you, you have to 
based on the needs, you have to talk about a lot of different types of training and teach them a lot of background in the different areas. So it'll probably be multiple modules that parents mm -hmm. can kind of pick and choose from for which ones are relevant. And so what that means is before we give that to anybody, we have to do the studies to make sure they work. Right. So for every training module, we're going to have to make sure that it works. So we're talking about probably five years of studies to make sure that they're all effective in the long run. Um, but that, that's the goal. We want mm -hmm. parents to be able to give this to parents to be able to help themselves in these situations. Yeah. And, and I would assume that if you were able to do that, Plus, it gives the parents who might feel a little powerless a sense of mm -hmm. like empowerment, being able to actually handle a situation that doesn't seem like they've been able to handle. So. Absolutely. You know, our goal, the goal of our therapy is for us to not be here. We want to mm -hmm. be able to teach the families so that they don't have to keep paying for the services. We don't want the children to be in services for their entire life. And so mm -hmm. if we can train the parents how to do it, it also saves a lot of money for them mm -hmm. as well. And then they feel competent. And if a new problem pops up that they don't know how to deal with, they can pull on that learning that, that we've taught yeah. them and be able to handle that or even with additional children. Too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that, um, when when my son when we were struggling with him when he was much younger with ADHD I remember many nights feeling pretty powerless of how I was going to how we were going to deal with it um mm -hmm. it was um and um you know thank goodness we got we got the proper help with with how to deal with it and he's doing much better but I remember how um how depressing it was <laughs> some nights to try to try to do what we needed to do. It was really dispiriting. So um, yeah, uh, that that's really exciting that you're you're gonna be developing that, so yeah. yeah. All right, um, does anybody have any other comments or questions for Corey? All right, well, we're right on the hour here. So um, I, wanna, I wanna thank you, Corey, for taking your time and, um, uh, and uh, telling us your story and telling us about your uh, research. Um, I think that, um, that that it's really fascinating, and I really applaud you and the work that you're doing um, for for uh, young children and families. Um, having a, having a, uh, nieces and uh, nephews that have autism on the autism spectrum, um, it really uh, uh, is is heartening that things like this are going on. So I'm excited to do it, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. And I, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight too. And if you um, and it, tell your friends that if you want to, that this uh, video will be up on uh, the Peter White website. If they missed it, they can certainly go there and watch it. So I really appreciate this time that you took with us, Corey. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. All right.